how the Senate does its business with regards to this issue. The, the, president, the fact is, because of the negotiations over the debt ceiling uh, that resulted in the Budget Control Act, we have an unusual situation here in that uh, the top lines for the budget going forward have already been set and agreed to by Republicans and Democrats alike. So the, the, I'm not actually asking your opinion, but the White House's opinion? The position well, I, mean, the White House I, I don't have a, I mean, is there, The White House has no opinion about whether or not the Senate should pass a budget. The President's going to introduce one. The Fed chair says not having one is bad for growth, but the White House has no opinion about whether... I have no opinion. The White House has no opinion on Chairman Bernanke's assessment of how the Senate ought to do its business. What the President believes is important is that the Budget Control Act that was signed into law by hand last year uh, provides the uh, top line spending caps uh, for uh, the coming budget, and he will uh, obviously meet those in the budget proposal he puts forward. And he looks forward to the Senate acting on um, the policy uh, initiatives contained within his budget that will reflect the priorities he laid out in the State of the Union, and also will reflect the priorities he laid out when he put forward his deficit and debt reduction uh, proposal back in September. So I don't, I don't think uh, there is any, uh, there will be, nor is there now, any doubt about the President's view uh, on where we ought to move with the budget. And, and just to follow up on the Syria question earlier from Nora, did um, there have been reports uh, that because of all that's going on, and I think it's homes, um, the, uh, there was a hospital that lost power and a number of premature babies died as a result. I, I don't uh, know if that's a true story or not. Obviously, in situations like this, there are a lot of rumors. Um, does the White House know anything about the extent of the violence, factually what's going on? I assume we have people on the ground there to a degree or another. Uh, are we monitoring exactly what has happened? Well, I can say that we have all here seen the reporting and some of the horrific video images of the of the escalation of violence that's taking place in Syria um, over the last few days, and it's res clearly resulted in the deaths of hundreds of civilians, um, and been uh, accompanied by troubling statements from senior regime officials who have pledged, quote, to cleanse the country of renegades and outlaws. Um, that is hardly reassuring, and only. Uh, reinforces the fact that the Assad regime is engaged in a brutal campaign to slaughter its own people, uh, a people that has, uh, this process began when, when the Syrian people peacefully demonstrated in support of, a, of reform and transition to democracy. Uh, so I, you know, I, I don't have any details to impart to you on the kinds of information we might have with regards to what's happening in Syria beyond uh, the news reports, but the news reports are bad enough. Thank you. Jack. Okay. okay, staying on Syria, you had said earlier that um, you were discussing with international partners the subject of humanitarian aid. Are you ruling out the U.S. providing humanitarian aid unilaterally? I'm not ruling that out, but we're working with our partners. Uh, there is a broad coalition of friends of Syria um, that extends uh, around the globe and, and includes nations in the region. Uh, so we have, as we have from the beginning, um, we will continue to work with our allies and partners on uh, this issue and with nations that are as concerned as we are about uh, the brutality uh, that's taking place in Syria. In um, the wake of the Russian foreign minister's trip to Damascus, do you have any reaction from the White House about the Russia's call for you know, the Western world to um, have, to have the uh, government there, the Assad government, engage in quote-unquote dialogue with the opposition. Do you see that as at all realistic or <coughs> potentially meaningful? I, I think, as you were, may recall, from the earlier days of, uh, of this situation in Syria, there was an opportunity for the Assad regime to engage in dialogue with the opposition, with the Syrian people who were demanding peaceful transition. Rather than take that opportunity, Assad brutally cracked down on his own people. And that 
crackdown continues to this day. I, uh, but we don't think that uh, that opportunity is available anymore. That it's clear that Assad has chosen a path, and uh, that choice has resulted in deaths of many, many Syrians, including innocent children, uh, and it's a horrific uh, result of that choice. So I don't, um, as we've said before, the, as I said yesterday, I believe, regarding uh, the foreign minister's visit to Syria, it's not clear what the purpose was. Uh, what is clear is that siding with the Assad regime at this stage will not get Russia anything except for the alienation of the Syrian people. Um, Alexis, and then more. There are members of the president's um, party who say that there's a lot mystified why the White House would want the contraception issue to continue uh, percolating like this day after day if his concept is trying to uh, communicate the support for women and their health, et cetera, that that is getting drowned out perhaps by the concerns that he's trying to allay. So I'm just trying to get at this idea between a day and 18 months. Could, could we expect the president soon to speak himself about this, to try to communicate better about what it is that he's trying to do? Lex, I appreciate the, the question, but I don't have any um, announcements to make about presidential statements or uh, news conferences or, uh, or, or anything like that nature. The, uh, uh, and my, my point about, which I concede was delivered somewhat glibly about the time frame here is that I don't, I'm not going to set an artificial deadline. The policy that was put forward and announced by Secretary Sebelius makes clear that the period of transition is there for a reason. Uh, you know, and as these uh, conversations and this dialogue continues, uh, you know, we'll have a better sense of, of timing on it. But I don't have any to predict to you today. I just want to ask you, would you agree that the idea that as this conversation continues is the thing that has the president on the ropes? Well, I, that your assessment here is not one that I agree with you. Yeah, agree with on, what are you asking? The White, House, the White House does not agree that the president is on the ropes because of the concept of this conversation continuing? No, I don't agree with uh, any of the phrases within that uh, sentence or question. Uh, the, uh, he's concerned here about getting a policy right and its implementation right and, and, and being sensitive as he uh, always is to uh, the concerns of religious groups about uh, religious freedom and, and uh, and, and their, their con uh, the, the convictions they hold. So uh, that's the approach that was taken in the development of this policy. Uh, it is the approach that is being taken in the conversations that will continue in an effort to implement it in a way that allays some of the concerns that have been expressed. Okay. Laura and then Mara. Oh, thank you. I have two questions <laughs> about Mara and Mara. <laughs> um, I have two questions about this talk, yeah? The first is I understand the objections that you expressed at the top but notwithstanding those, if that bill were presented, would the <coughs> president sign it? If which bill were presented? The, the Senate bill? bill? The House bill. Why well, is the Senate voted on? I mean, the House hasn't voted well, on it. I know, but I'm trying and to... All I'm, I, I, I'm hoping that the House doesn't do what the reports suggest it's doing, the House Republicans. I think, try explaining that to your constituents. You know, that you, you watered down this legislation to, to give, you know, because Wall Street and hedge funds and others, you know, didn't like it. I, I, I just, we just think that's a terrible idea. And this should be, this was an example of, in the Senate, of broad bipartisan support. The provisions that the House Republicans are seeking to remove are ones that were uh, put forward by Republicans, so in the Senate. So it's just, uh, it's, this is an opportunity to do something that's right, uh, that will uh, send a signal to the American people that Congress agrees with them that, that there needs to be transparency and uh, political reform in Congress. It, it seemed like uh, for a while that there was broad consensus, uh, bipartisan consensus to get this done, and unfortunately based on my early morning reading, um, that may not be the case. So we urge Congress and the House in particular, House Republicans in particular, to uh, abandon the effort to water it down and instead focus on uh, getting it done. 
I mean, Nancy Pelosi has said that she's going to support it and urge people to support it. So what I'm trying to understand, and maybe you're Again, not prepared to I, say I, whether those concerns are serious enough to... Um, I'm not sure that... Uh, that Leader Pelosi has said that she would support something that hasn't even emerged yet from the back rooms of the House Republican leadership meeting. So I I think that, uh, and then there's a question, obviously, as is the case in all these things, that if the House dramatically changes the bill, then what happens in terms of reconciliation? We support the, the bill, the proposal, as the President said in the State of the Union address, that would ban insider trading among members of Congress. We support the bill as it emerged from the Senate by a vote of 96 to 3, including uh, amendments uh, put forward by uh, Senators Grassley and Senators, uh, Senators Grassley and Cornyn. Uh, we hope that House Republicans will do the same. And what is your, what is the White House's view on extending these provisions to the executive branch? <laughs> I understand that there's been a furtive, I mean, not a furtive, that's the wrong word, a, a very public, uh, although humorous, attempt by some on, uh, among the House Republicans to uh, suggest that that's an issue when the absolute fact uh, is that uh, there are far more uh, stringent uh, rules and restrictions on the executive branch already in place. Uh, as uh, I'm sure they know, uh, and I would quote from an article on a slightly separate issue, issue today uh, in, uh, I think, the Washington Post. Public citizen uh, government, uh, public citizen, uh, as you know, is a government watchdog group. Uh, Craig Holman said, quote, the executive branch has far strict, stricter ethics standards than Congress does, and Congress has set these standards. The executive branch can't steer contracts or work to businesses where family members work. They can't even own stock in industries that they oversee, unlike Congress. It's complete hypocrisy. So, uh, again, we are fine with the Stock Act as it emerged from the Senate. We certainly look forward to the House uh, taking action uh, as it sh appropriately should on this bipartisan measure, and, and, and the President will sign it into law. Uh, I, I am just struck by the effort to water it down behind closed doors, uh, you know, presumably because of objections by financial institutions and their lobbyists. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, there's been a little bit of confusion about this insider trading. Is there is insider trading currently legal for members of Congress? It sounds like something that's already. I believe legal. it is not banned. That's the point it's of the not legislation. Banned, even though insider trading, and in, by definition, is something that's not legal. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's something that will be made illegal by this legislation that isn't. I think it explicitly legal. bans insider trading as well as well as does a number of other things that are included in in the bill. I, I would. I would address your right now. Insider trading is not illegal for members of Congress. Well, it's certainly not explicitly banned, and I would, you know, point you to the authors of the legislation. Okay, and my, my next second question, just about contraception, which I've tried to stay away from at least for forty-eight hours, is: um, <laughs> um, Do you okay. feel that this? I mean, this has got a tremendous <laughs> amount of questions. Obviously, taking up a lot of time here. Do you feel that this is a controversy that is that is a press-driven controversy, as many things can, can be, or is this a real um, debate that's really gripped a lot of people, or do you think this well, is one of those things that we are are <coughs> jitting up? No, I, look, I think, uh, and and more importantly, the president thinks that the concerns expressed by uh, some religious groups and religious individuals. Uh, are understandable, and that's why, even prior to those experience, uh, concerns being expressed, the, the policy included a transition period where uh, discussions would be had, would take place uh, around an effort to implement the policy in a way that allayed those concerns. So uh, I think that it's important to, in terms of our actions and reactions here, to note that from the beginning we understood the sensitivity of this. That is why we sought the balance that we did in the policy itself, why churches and houses of worship are exempted, uh, and why this transition period uh, was a part of the rule, uh, and, and, and why we're having these conversations. So, uh, I, you know, obviously, in a case like this, sometimes uh, folks try to make uh, political hay out of it, and, and, and that's 
the way the system works and the process works, but but 